Through studying the international dimensions of education, we can highlight three key areas affecting global education. The first is globalisation, defined by Shields 2013 in stating that globalisation entails that many aspects of a country's educational policies are not determined by its national government, but rather by the declarations and commitments of international organisations. The second is internationalisation, defined in terms of education as the enhancing of student knowledge and the comprehension of different countries, enabling students to compare and analyse from international perspectives. The third is comparative education, measured on scales such as PISA. Our area of focus looks at the intersection between globalisation and internationalisation. It is at this intersection that we see global exchanges between the international economy, in international culture and in international education. During our research, we began to raise questions surrounding the influences on education in developing countries. We found ourselves asking questions. Questions such as, who sets the standards for global education? And are such standards coming from the industrialization and capitalist models supplied by organizations such as USAID and World Bank? And by whose standard is global education measured? Is it primarily a Western standard? And when the EFA movement decided in Senegal in April 2000 that developing countries would have increased access to learning life skills, who was it that decided what was a valuable life skill in each culture? If, according to Mincer in 1958, the EFA is rooted in human capital theory, whereby there will be a later yield of economic return, whose economy will truly benefit? We had questions asking what influences corporations or organisations had on education in developing countries and are children only educated to work and overall what kind of influence do companies have on education. So do corporations or organisations and the global economy have an impact on the standard of education throughout the world? This leads us to question is education a business? Apple, in discussing neoliberalism and neoconservatism, draws attention to the possibility of global education holding an economic agenda. Apple continues to state that education on a global scale acts as an arena for issues of policy, finance, curriculum and pedagogy. We turn to the world of capitalist globalization, asking what organizations impact global education. The World Bank is a powerful organization comprised of five key institutions specializing in international affairs. It lends money to governments for purposes of reconstruction and development. The International Development Association, however, specialises in lending interest-free loans to the governments of the poorest countries. The controversy surrounding this aspect of World Bank will be explored further. Other areas include the IFC, which focuses on developing the private sector in developing countries. The MIGA focuses on supporting economic growth, reducing poverty and improving the quality of people's lives. MIGA also offers political risk insurance to its investors and lenders. The ICSID serves as the enforcement branch of the World Bank Group, settling investment disputes. So, what are the negative implications of World Bank's lending? A publication by Samoff and Carroll, which is supported by UNESCO, indicates the large amount of control which World Bank has over its borrowing countries. It draws attention to a set of rules known as conditionalities set by World Bank into the loan agreement. World Bank lends large amounts of money to the continent of Africa. The Samoff and Carroll publication indicates that Kenya was the largest borrower from World Bank for educational funding between 1964 and 2002, borrowing approximately 55 million US dollars for funding its higher education services. With this loan came the conditionalities from World Bank dictating the way in which higher education was financed, expanded and managed. 
as well as capping the number of students to public universities to just 10,000. They reformed the way in which the student loan scheme operated. And ultimately, for the first time, tuition fees were introduced, charging Kenya's students for higher education. Within this westernised educational business model, some of the funds for higher education are generated from Kenya's own people, thus imitating Western capitalism. A criticism for this approach is that predominantly only wealthier individuals can obtain a higher education, leading to discriminant access to education, employment and financial wealth. Creating a formally educated, wealthy elite as seen in many Western models. Another conditionality set by World Bank required the Kenyan Educational Board to reclaim any previously unpaid student loan debts, squeezing additional revenue from its already struggling young graduates and dropouts, many of which who have entered an economy which lacks in jobs and opportunities. We could argue that this is yet another move which benefits the more wealthier members of the country. World Bank is just one example of an organisational impact upon education. International organisations such as USAID, UNESCO and the International Monetary Fund all work in conjunction with the United Nations to fund an ever-increasing list of developing countries. It is reasonable to assume that many of these lending agreements may come with their own conditionalities, which could potentially be promoting capitalist market values as reflected in World Bank's lending strategy. Torres and Morrow, in a discussion of globalisation, indicate that capitalism spreads as a world system, where global education systems become a reproduction of those used in capitalist nation-states. Brock highlights the potential damages of certain ideal qualities which may be presented with informal schooling systems when introduced to developing countries, raising the point that traditional formal qualities are geared towards more intellectual intelligence with practical and technical skills, rather than perhaps preparing children for the more realistic environment in which they will live. In our analysis, we see the potential danger in the promotion of these qualities, qualities which are promoted in Western capitalism but may be redundant in developing countries. Skills are simply not equally valuable across countries and cultures. An economic agenda can be seen on a corporate level as well as an organisational level. The Education for All Global Monitoring Report by UNESCO indicates that most private ICT companies direct their charitable educational contributions towards emerging markets such as Brazil, Argentina, China, Chile and Mexico, rather than to poorer countries. This suggests that the companies are expecting an economic return on their investment. The same report describes how Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Ford Foundation as well as the massive corporation Banco Santander who allocate a high majority of their grants towards scholarships of higher education despite the severe lack of basic good quality primary education in developing countries. Our analysis of this is that large corporations that invest in education expect a quick economic return with fast results by investing in higher education rather than at the more desperate level of primary education. So, why do we care? We understand that capitalism, corporations and large businesses have lifted millions of the world's poorest people out of poverty. The purpose of this video was not to point the finger and blame large companies and corporations as an evil influence. It was to highlight the power that they hold over global education and more as an act of concern over what may be lost in spreading the Western standard of education to developing countries. If the Western model is spread, which promotes skills and qualities which work well in our country, are we under-equipping the next generation in developing countries? From our research, we see that, yes, education is a business. However, we see the relevancy as to the good a capitalist drive can create. We simply do not want people to lose sight of the realistic situations in which people in developing countries live. Thank you.